Well, good afternoon, everyone. Thank you for joining us here today. My name is Megan Williams, and I'm the Director of Support Services at Alzheimer Group. Alzheimer Group is a charitable organization who supports families and individuals living with dementia, as well as professionals through various programs, including lectures like today. We have various courses, as well as an activity center and online support groups. Today's lecture is made possible by the generous support of the Lindsay Memorial Foundation and the Lasner Learning Center. AGI, as I mentioned, is a charitable organization and we rely on donations. So at any time, please feel free to call the office and donate at any time. So just a little, a few housekeeping issues for today. Um, again, everyone is going to be muted. You can use the chat function or the Q&A function at the bottom of your screen and write any questions you have uh, for Dr. Chu, and we will have time at the end and hopefully um, to answer everyone's questions. Today's lecture is actually a follow-up talk to the teleconference on January 12th, which was um, essentially talking about uh, the D word, demystifying dementia. In the talk in January 12th, um, we talked about what is dementia and how it was diagnosed. And today, Dr. Chu will be addressing symptoms about dementia, treatment options, and how to start planning for the future. Dr. Wendy Chu is an assistant professor of geriatric medicine at McGill University and a geriatrician at the Montreal General Hospital uh, McGill University Health Center. Her work primarily involves multidisciplinary assessments and rehabilitation of the frail elderly at the MGH Geriatric Day Hospital. So without further ado, Dr. Chu, the floor is yours. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you so much for having me back uh, with my apologies that I ran out of time the first uh, in the first place in January. Uh, but yes, exactly um, uh, as advertised, uh, I will uh, do a quick recap of what was discussed in January uh, for those who, who weren't there. And then uh, I'll get more into uh, what wasn't discussed, um, particularly things like uh, planning and treatment. Um, just as before, yes, there we go, to mention that I have uh, no pharmaceutical company affiliations. I'm not affiliated with any private uh, organizations or services that I mention here. Um, but I did have family members who dealt with cognitive issues. And so I'm hoping that that gives me a little bit of a of an insight of a little bit of a sensitivity, at least, to to what you may be going through. So in terms of overview, and I'm not sure why my computer is going nuts, but anyhow, uh, we, we talked a bit about the brain, some of the terminology, which I'll briefly recap, um, types of dementias. And uh, I have to admit, I thought we talked about symptoms, but I'll go into them anyhow this time, but focusing mostly on, on treatment and some other issues. So to recap, dementia, this word dementia, it's a scary word, the D word, you know, it's worse, you know, back uh, 10, 20 years ago, it was the C word, right? Like cancer, nobody ever spoke about cancer, right? Because it was shameful and so forth. Well, now we're, people, are, people are running marathons for cancer, right? So dementia has still got a little bit of a stigma about it, but all the word means is that there is objective evidence of something going on with the cognition, the, the, the memory and so forth, that's some sort of cognitive impairment and that it's having an impact in the way the day, the, the daily life of the person, okay? It's having an impact on function, okay? It is not normal aging. It may look like depression or delirium. Flip side, depression and delirium may look like dementia. And there are some certain medical conditions that may also mimic dementia, okay? So a lot of the process of diagnosing is to rule out those sorts of things as well. So, there is cognitive impairment. What does cognition mean? I myself frequently slip and say memory, but it's more than just memory, okay? It's things like language, 
you know, trouble finding words, less fluent. It's uh, things like sometimes even uh, perceiving things in space, visual, spatial, or even seeing for that matter. It can deal with ability to learn. It can deal with feelings, um, taking initiative, judgment, so-called frontal functions. All these kinds of things are considered cognition. And while memory is the most typical thing um, early on, or especially that people notice, dementias can also present first with these other things, which make it sort of harder to say, oh, you know what, is that cognitive? Is that dementia? Um, or is that person just, you know, being insensitive and rude to me? Okay, so cognitive impairment. And how is that diagnosed? Um, to have objective evidence of that cognitive impairment, Typically, it's first seeing the family doctor. Hey, doc, I'm worried about something's going on with my memory. I'm worried something's going on with my dad's memory, et cetera, et cetera, okay? And the family doctor, if they're um, uh, not assessing cognition themselves or it's something unusual and they, they want uh, further assessment, specialized assessment, they may then refer to a geriatrician uh, and or a neurologist, depending on the situation, okay? And then whichever physician it is, they're gonna do a physical exam with focus on the neurological exam, looking for certain signs that might suggest, okay, is it, you know, is there a dementia going on? What kind of it is it, et cetera? Uh, they will review the medications to make sure that there's no side effects that may be mimicking dementia. They will typically do blood tests. Usually it's not to diagnose a dementia, but it's to rule out other things that may look like dementia. And they may or may not, especially the neurologist, may or may not do other specialized tests. They will do though so-called neuropsychological screening tests or, or memory tests, cognitive screening tests. Okay, the most famous of which, uh, as publicized by a former U.S. president, is the one called the MOCA. But basically, what these tests are doing are looking at these different higher brain functions, not just memory, but visual, perceptual, language, fluency, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera, okay, ability to multitask. Right. This may then also involve other kinds of healthcare professionals when it's still not clear what's going on or it's something very uh, atypical. We may then be referring to an actual neuropsychologist, a specialist in doing more detailed neuropsychological or cognitive screening. We may be referring to a speech therapist when there's, say, a very prominent impact on language. Uh, and, and a speech language pathologist has the, um, uh, the, the professional knowledge to help discern what might be going on and what's causing that, as well as what to do about it. Uh, and occupational therapists, um, occupation, like what do you occupy yourself with, if you can think sort of grossly like that? How is it affecting the person's function? Physiotherapists, if it's starting to affect things like movement and so forth, okay? Uh, geriatricians and neurologists may also order uh, brain scans, CT scans, CAT scans of the brain or other uh, specialized brain scans, but not necessarily, okay? Uh, depends what they need to make the diagnosis. But all of that to say, there is no one single test that says, ah, this is dementia, okay? It has to be all of these things put together. Most importantly, it has to be put together with what we call the history. Okay, the story, the information that the person themselves or the family or, or les proches, as they say, uh, the significant others bring to the physician to say what has been going on. And to be frank, if I did have to pick you know, one test to say that that's the most important to make the diagnosis, it is actually the history. All the other things, the physical exam, the neuropsychological screening tests, the other professionals, the other scans, are all to kind of prove or disprove parts of the history, if you will, okay? So what is it in the history that we will be asking you to tell us so that we can try to help figure out what's going on? Firstly, we're gonna ask you, what is the baseline, okay? What was the person like before things started to change, whatever that, thing is, okay? Before they started having trouble in finding their words, before they started having trouble in uh, working, in, um, uh, in paying their bills, what were they like before? Did they ever pay their bills? 
No, it was always, you know, my dad who paid the bills and they always had financial people. My mother never did this kind of thing. Okay, maybe it's something that's new to her and that needs to be actually learned. It's not just that she can do it sort of thing, you know. So what is the baseline to see has there been a change from baseline? It's always a question of change. Then we're going to ask, what is the timeline of that change? Okay, how long has this been going on? Is this something that they were fine, 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 and then boom, there was a sudden change? Or has this been something that's actually been going on for a year, two years, three years, that's gradually been getting worse, but now it's much more obvious because some event happened, okay? And it's often very hard to think of, you know, well, when did it really start? One useful way to think of it is think of, of concrete time points in the past. You know, she's having trouble to cook, okay? How about last Christmas? How about last, um, I don't know, uh, you know, whatever kind of event, was your mother able to get the meal together at that time? Okay. Um, they were having forgetting appointments and this and that. Okay. Was your husband, you know, last summer when you had appointments, when, when you were traveling, was he able to remember those kinds of things? And sometimes those concrete points in time help you think, okay, no, no, wait a minute. It wasn't that sudden. And it was actually something going on then as well. We will ask if there's that functional impact, right? Because we said there is objective evidence of cognitive impairment that's having a functional impact. So what is that functional impact? Impact on the so-called instrumental activities of daily living, the things that you basically need to maintain a domestic life, cook, clean, pay the bills, that kind of thing, transport. Um, it may also include more higher level things like working, more subtle things like social interactions, leisure activities. Um, and it'll also include things like basic activities of daily living, basically what you needed to get up this morning, okay? You needed to, to, to mobilize yourself out of bed, toilet, wash, dress, eat, that kind of thing, right? So I'll ask you, you know, have these things started to change? Um, we will ask you about the types of symptoms. What have you actually noticed? Now, some of them may be physical symptoms that seem completely unrelated, like, are they having trouble walking? Well, I'm here about my memory. Why are you asking about my walking? Because there are certain types of dementias that may affect both memory and walking. And we want to know, is that what's going on? We may ask about bladder control. I've had many people kind of get offended. You know, why are you asking me about my bladder? And I say it's because there may be certain kinds of conditions that can affect both. Ah, okay, it's clear. But we'll mostly ask you for examples. You're saying your memory is not as good. You're saying that you're, you're having trouble thinking. You're having trouble uh, uh, speaking. Okay, be specific. Give us some examples, okay? For example, um, problems with judgment, financial decision-making, less interest in hobbies, classic one. My wife was an avid, avid reader. She would read six books at a time. There would be books all over the house. Now I find her staring at the same page of the book for like an hour. And when I ask her about it, she tells me, oh, it's not an interesting book and puts it aside. Okay, it could very well be not an interesting book. It could very well be she has other things on her mind, okay, and is distracted, is anxious, is worried about other things. But could it be that there's some sort of functional change that the brain cognitively is no longer able to do that hobby? Okay? Um, becoming very, very repetitive. Certain degree is repetitive. And there are some people at baseline, you know, not, not uh, speaking for a friend here, but uh, there are some people at baseline who are very repetitive. But if it's a change, that's interesting to know. Uh, frankly, getting disoriented to time. Okay. If, they, if they always knew what the time was, but now they, 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 they have trouble with that, trouble with financial affairs, uh, like paying the bills, overpaid, double paid, trouble remembering appointments, um, problems uh, yeah, well, with memory, et cetera, et cetera. They're basically trying to say, be as specific as you can, okay? because we use all of this information not only to make the diagnosis of dementia, but we also use it, particularly the functional impact to stage what's going on. So in terms of making the diagnosis, if there's no functional impact, okay, and, and there's no objective evidence, 
you know, this, this person may be perfectly fine, or they may be in that sort of gray zone where they feel something is going on, but you just can't put your finger objectively on it. But as things go on, starting to develop objective signs, but without functional impact, and then once we're calling it a dementia or what they say now, major neurocognitive disorder, mild, moderate, moderately severe, severe is based on how much of a functional impact it has, ranging from very high level instrumental tasks like finances and so forth, social interactions, to very basic activities of daily living like personal care, okay? That's why all these questions could get asked. And that's why if you know information is power, if you know that these are the kinds of things that would be asked, then you know what to think about and what to report and say, okay? We will also ask questions about safety because maybe there are no issues about safety, but maybe some of the functional impact uh, will actually put the person or other people's safety at risk. The most common one being driving, I'll come back to that in a sec, but that's the most contentious one. Um, is there a risk of fire for getting the stove on? Has the person gotten lost? Double dosing medications. Uh, I, I, in fact, a person I was just seeing earlier today uh, was having falls and fainting spells. And it turns out it was probably related to double dosing her blood pressure pills. And so her blood pressure would go really low and she would fall and faint, you know, faint and fall rather. Um, are they at risk of being uh, abused financially, exploited? Are they able to call for help if they need help? You know, do they even know to dial 911? Do they know how to dial, uh, how to call a family member? And particularly in the States, as we know in the news very recently, um, we may even need to ask about access to dangerous things like firearms. We will ask also about uh, impact on behavior, uh, like emotions, like ability to plan, uh, to be able to inhibit, uh, 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 you know, she has no filter anymore, you know, it, it, boy, your dress is really ugly. I mean, oh my God, okay, normally you wouldn't, I can't even say that to her. Normally she wouldn't say something like that. Now she just says the first thing that comes to her mind, okay, is that some sort of change in behavior? that is actually related to what's going on. Um, and these kinds of things uh, may be very subtle, may actually be quite pleasant, um, or may be quite unpleasant, like they're more aggressive or they're just more clingy and anxious. Um, it may be things like executive dysfunction. They don't have that judgment. They're impulsive. They're disinhibited. Um, you know, an extreme example, and I should have given this disclaimer early on, but just because I mentioned something here, again, does not mean it's going to happen to you. It does not mean it's going to happen to your family member. But if it does, you're aware and you can say, hey, maybe this is related to the dementia. I need to discuss this with somebody. Okay, what do we do? So sometimes, you know, more advanced disease, uh, disinhibition may even be time to take clothes off. Okay. Um, now, there may be a reason, what we call responsive behaviors. There may actually be a reason the person's doing this, like they're hot, or it's uncomfortable, it's itchy, um, or something like that, in which case we try to try to figure out what, why are they responding in this way? What was the trigger? Um, but sometimes we just can't figure that out, okay? Behavioral changes, as I mentioned, repetitiveness, but there can be pacing, there can be yelling, you know, you know help, 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 help. You know, what's wrong? What's wrong? nothing. Hi, how are you? <laughs> what are you doing? Kind of thing. This is, this is the behavioral type of symptoms. Um, hiding things, hoarding things, you know, they're going to steal it if I don't hide it. And then they, the, the, you know, then it's hidden and then you can't find it anymore, you know. In extreme scenarios, particularly in more advanced disease or in certain types of dementias, there can be frankly psychotic symptoms. And what that is, is, you know, like paranoia, false beliefs, what we call delusions, okay? You know, everybody's trying to steal from me. Well, you know, no mom, who would really want to steal your toothbrush, you know? But this is the person's reality. Their brain is trying to make sense of what's going on. If I can't find my toothbrush, well, somebody must have taken it, especially if that was their personality, you know, even when they were well sort of thing. Somebody else must have done it. Somebody else must have taken it. Um, they, you know, I had a, a gentleman earlier this week who was insisting that yesterday, he, telling his family that he was at a cabana sucre 
you know, yes, we were at a cabana sucre. I saw your uncle there and blah, blah, blah kind of thing. You know what? You can't convince the person otherwise. This is really what they believe, uh, not because they're being, you know, uh, mean or, or pig headed or anything like that. It's just because that's what their brain actually is perceiving as reality. And sometimes those perceptions, uh, abnormal perceptions of reality can be frank hallucinations, seeing things, bugs, people, animals, hearing things, um, you know, listen to them talking about me over there, uh, sort of thing, okay? There may be fluctuations in this behavior. There may be certain times of day where things get worse, so-called sundowning as the day goes on, uh, things tend to get worse. Um, and as I mentioned earlier, they may be in response to things, try to figure out what that response, what that trigger is, but sometimes we don't know what the trigger is. Okay. Um, so these are the so-called behavioral and psychological symptoms of dementia, BPSD. These are all the kinds of things we'll ask. Okay. There, dementia, though, the word is just an umbrella term for many different kinds of illnesses that can cause these symptoms of dementia. The most common being Alzheimer's, but there are also dementias related to problems with circulation, so-called vascular dementias, like strokes and so forth. Uh, and there's some less common but very specific kinds of illnesses like Lewy body dementia, which can look like Parkinson's disease, which can have frank psychotic symptoms. But ultimately, as time goes on, you realize there's a lot more cognitive issues, and it's actually this dementia type of illness. Frontotemporal dementia, which presents primarily initially with those frontal you know, uh, type of symptoms, um, but eventually you see the rest of it coming on and so on and so forth. And at the end of this, uh, I give much more details. Um, uh, I, I think that I uh, emailed um, a handout, a PDF on this. I'll, I'll put it in the chat afterwards when I can access the chat. Um, so all of these symptoms can vary between the types of dementias. They can vary from person to person with the same type of dementia, but not to be a downer, but all of these are typically neurodegenerative. The brain cells are, 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 are shrinking, they're degenerating, and ultimately all of them will develop losses of function and so on and so forth, okay? So why do I say that? Let's get into finally part two. How long have I been talking here? Um, we want to say these things because if we see what's going on, if we see what might happen or is happening, then we can treat it, we can deal with it. And what is the dealing with it? To be honest, the mainstay of treatment is getting informed, getting the support to deal with all of this because it's, it's, it's tricky to deal with all of this, whether you're living with it or you're living with a person living with it. Uh, planning and adapting around what the brain is able to do. Okay, planning for what the brain isn't able to do or will not be able to do, rather, and adapting around what the brain is not able to do. Okay, that unfortunately is where the science is still at, is really kind of adapting around things. Okay, there are certain symptoms though that we can treat, particularly those behavioral and psychological symptoms of dementia, which I'll come to in more detail as well as just making sure the rest of one's health is, is stable and, and is continuing to be cared for. Although, you know, why was I saying overall these are neurodegenerative conditions is that the treatment or, or testing for other kinds of illnesses may need to be put into that big picture of dementia, okay? You know, do I really want to have this very aggressive test that may not change anything in the end? Do I really want to have this very aggressive treatment that may make me quite ill and that may only, you know, get me, you know, a very modest benefit knowing that this is the big picture? Maybe instead I'll say, no, that's not my goal of care to just survive. My goals of care are to have quality of life. And this is how I define quality of life, okay? So to put it in that big pictures thing. And then there are some cognition specific treatments with and without medications, which I will come into, okay? So number one, information and support. Information is power. Just as I mentioned earlier, having, awareness and anticipating what may be the symptoms, what are going to be kind of the, the potential management treat and treatments for it, 
Um, knowing medications, forget about dementias. If you're taking medications, inform yourself. What are the potential side effects of this medication? Because if something happens, you know, you're, you're taking calcium pills for osteoporosis, okay? Boy, I'm really, really constipated. Oh, look, one of the side effects of calcium can be constipation. Okay, so what do I need to do about it, you know? Um, so just knowing medication side effects, because uh, could it be causing memory problems? Or could it worsen memory problems in somebody who already has a dementia, let's say? And have the resources to deal with these sorts of things um, so that you know who to ask, you know what to ask, and you're not afraid to ask these kinds of things, whether you're the person with dementia or you're the family member, the caregiver of the person with dementia, okay? Because then you can advocate for yourself. You can advocate for your person. The reality is, the system is a system, okay? And even the most caring healthcare professionals are in a system. So they may not always know this is your concern. They may not always ask, is, do you have other concerns or, or, or problems going on? So you can say, okay, this is what's going on. I need help for this. Um, this is what's important to me. How do we achieve that goal kind of thing, you know? Do I really need this kind of medication if what's important to me is another thing, you know? So to be able to, and, and to be honest, again, this is, forget about dementia. This is anybody dealing with any kind of health issue, you know? Um, what matters most to you in life? Um, one important thing about advocacy is also advocating for yourself in the sense of, what are your limits, okay? You, your person, you're, you're the one living with dementia. What, are, what is your limit in terms of, um, you know, when am I gonna say enough is enough? Okay, and this has been in the news. I, I wasn't planning to get into it a lot this talk, but we certainly can if it's in the chat. Um, but it was in the news a lot uh, this summer um, about medical aid in dying um, being extended to people who are able to make that decision now, but later on because of their illness, may not be capable of making that decision and may not be competent to make that decision, typically things like Alzheimer's, okay? Um, if you have a sense of these kinds of things already to say, listen, these are my goals. My goals are, I wanna be able to continue to work as long as possible. I wanna be able to live at home as long as possible. Okay, what is it that we need to do or not do that we don't need to do so that we can achieve these goals for you. And of course, the goals may change over time. We should revise the goals. What was something like, oh, I never want to be in that state later on. Maybe, hey, it's actually not that bad. We revise them as things go along. But to, 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 to know what it is that you can and cannot do for the person or what you want or do not want for yourself, okay? That's why information and the support to, to, to ask, the support to advocate, um, because it can be a very, very difficult thing to, to, to ask questions, to say no, uh, to deal with the information that you get, like today, <laughs> you know, to just have a place to vent, okay? I put the runners here because uh, you'll often hear this pithy expression, um, uh, living with dementia or caring for a person living with dementia is a marathon. You know, cancer is a sprint, uh, Alzheimer's is a marathon. And what it means is that, you know, cal cal cancer obviously is, is no picnic either, but oftentimes cancer, you can predict where things are going. And when things are not going well, they very quickly don't go well, okay? But things like Alzheimer's can just go on and on and on and on and on and on and on kind of thing, sometimes for years and years and years. And so if you go running out of the gate at full speed at the beginning of the marathon, you will have no energy left to complete it, okay? Um, so you need to pace yourself in the beginning and then you have enough energy to complete that marathon, okay? And, and having started running about five years ago um, and painfully having actually done a marathon, I totally understand what it means now, as well as the expression, what it means to hit the wall. Same thing goes with caregiving. You may hit a wall if you don't pace yourself. 
So obviously, as mentioned earlier, there are uh, excellent community organizations like AGI um, that are there to give you this information, to help support you, to help guide you through the system um, and, and cope with what's going on. Alzheimer's Society as well, nationally. Um, so for example, if you have family member, you know, you have the, uh, your sister in Toronto, who's always uh, double um, second guessing what you're you're doing for mom kind of thing, doesn't seem to really understand what's going on. Hey, take a look at this website, you know, so that you understand what the doctor has been telling me is going on. There are books, support groups, and of course, family and friends um, and caregiver specific resources. I just give you some QR codes there if you just want to quickly scan it with your phone. And of course, you'll, you'll, you'll have this for yourself to refer to later. The only thing I'll say though about support groups whether they're part of an organization, informal, and certainly family or friends, the neighbor, is buyer beware. Because just because folks are saying it, even, even official folks are saying it, it doesn't necessarily mean it applies to you, okay? It may, they may have other health conditions that make it apply to them, but not to you. Or it may actually be wrong, okay? It may actually be incorrect. I, I, I used to do this online support group for a family, as a caregiver for a family member with a particular uh, neurological illness, okay, very weird neurological illness. And one day somebody posts on there, you know, hey, I noticed my skin is kind of modely looking and a little bit cool kind of thing. What does that mean? You know, is that part of this illness? And somebody else wrote back, very well-meaning person. I looked up what modeled cold skin means, and it means uh, that you're, it means close to death. I'm like, holy smokes, you know, like I was trying to not get involved too much to reveal that I was a healthcare professional, I wanted to be there as family kind of thing. But I had to respond to that because it actually very well could be a symptom of the illness. You are not necessarily close to death. And if you were, you would probably not be posting this question on an online forum. Okay. So buyer beware, caveat emptor, but tremendously helpful. I found them tremendously helpful. Um, you know, I can know things as a professional, but to know them as a person can be very different. Okay. The other reason that you want to know about everything, you know, what are the, what are the symptoms and signs? What's the process to be diagnosed? What are the different types of dementia? What are the different uh, potential outcomes and so forth? Is not only to get informed and make sure you have the support through it, but is also to plan, okay? Particularly if you are the person living with dementia, you've just been diagnosed with dementia, the most important thing that you can do right now is to plan, okay? Another pithy expression is to hope for the best, but plan for the worst, okay? You know, life insurance. Hopefully we never have to use that life insurance or disability insurance or car insurance, okay? Hopefully we never need to use it, but if something happens, a disaster happens, boy, is it good that we had that life insurance, right? Okay. So same thing here. Maybe things will be perfectly fine. Maybe something completely else will happen to you. You know, who knows? I, I may get hit by a bus today going home today. You know, who knows? Okay. But in case it does happen, you've planned. Okay. So what kinds of things? So if you're working, if you own a business, retirement planning, okay, have the insight to say, you know what? I've been starting to have trouble with this. My colleagues have started been commenting on, hey, you know, you're late with that project again, or, or, or saying that, you know, I'm not sure I'm being accurate here. I have to keep getting my work double checked to say, hey, you know what, maybe it's time for me to retire, or at least plan my retirement, particularly if I know I have an illness that may decline, okay? Succession planning is an important one. If you own a business, you've got to have a plan what happens to you? What happens to you if you get hit by a bus tomorrow, okay? What happens to you if you have a dementia that gradually worsens, okay? You don't, the last thing you want is for your business to go under because there was no organization of who would continue to run things if something happened to you, okay? And, and I have several patients where sadly that's what's going on uh, or they're squabbling between the various uh, board members or family members or whatever for the business sort of thing. Okay. Having said that, though, if you are able to continue to do your work, and people are saying, you know, 
hey, it's doing good, they're not expressing any concerns, then keep doing it, okay? So I, I had a, a, a patient once where, who was a, a seamstress par excellence, okay? Like she was so good, apparently you, you could barely even see the seams <laughs> that she would, when she would sew, the stitches rather when she would sew. Um, and so everybody would bring their clothes to her. Hey, could you alter this? Hey, could you make me, uh, my daughter, uh, a graduation gown and blah, blah, blah. Famous with the neighborhood. Um, and her daughter asked me, you know, hey, you know, she's got dementia now. Should she really be accepting neighbors asking her to do things? And I said, well, are the neighbors complaining? Nope, they're happy with the work. Pff, then keep going, you know. And if they ever start to complain or kind of dropping off, not asking her for work anymore, okay, there's probably a problem there. We deal. But you know what, if she's able to do it, absolutely do it. You know, because what, what, she loves sewing. What's, what, what, uh, sh that's her raison d'etre. That's her identity. Why should we stop, okay? So if you're the caregiver for somebody in this kind of situation, yeah. If it's safe, encourage to keep going. Okay? Legal documents, the paperwork, planning for the future, okay? And the Quebec uh, Public Curator website has tons of good information on this, including some changes that are coming up uh, with the process and the law in, in the next few uh, months. It's going to delay it again, but anyhow. But things like, you know, if you're not able to pay your bills and manage your finances, is there somebody who could do it for you? Either simply because you temporarily can't get to the bank or things like that, somebody you trust who can could do that for you, or in case you become incapable of doing those things, is there somebody that you can name in case of your incapacity to protect you <laughs> to have to, to become your mandatory to do these things, to continue to represent you if you're not able to do them yourself, so-called protection mandate. And of course, everybody knows about wills and so forth. But to be honest, the wills are important, especially if you've got, you know, a complicated affairs and whatnot. Um, but to be honest, for me as a health professional, the most important thing is that we know what it is you want. We know who it is that you want to represent you and, and, and then we work with that because we want to do as much as possible that represents what you want, what your family member wants, okay? Um, and speaking of finances, um, you know what? There's a lot of things that can be automated, auto uh, payment of bills, uh, for direct deposits of pensions, um, uh, family members abroad helping doing online banking. COVID was wonderful for this. I actually very much resisted doing online banking personally myself. Uh, now that's pretty much all I and my and, and, and my family members do anymore is online banking, okay? But it's particularly if you've got things like investments, properties, make sure that there are plans uh, to manage all of those things. Driving. This could be a whole talk in and of itself if it hasn't been already, but driving, you know, driving is never routine. Oh, I'm just, you know, in my neighborhood. Oh, I'm just going to, you know, the, the local shopping mall. Driving is never routine. Yesterday I was driving and this uh, kid uh, suddenly, he, you know, these skateboarders, he, he's, it's fun. He's going down these stairs, but the stairs end at the sidewalk, okay? So he's barreling down the stairwell with, on his skateboard, and he turns to stop at the sidewalk, but of course his skateboard doesn't immediately stop. So he actually ends up hopping into the street, okay? Um, off the sidewalk. Now, luckily I saw him coming down, okay? So I started slowing down, anticipating what if this guy falls or hops in the street and sure enough, that's what he did. So I was able to, you know, make a little round kind of thing. But what that meant was, okay, I'm driving, I'm listening to my radio, I see that kid with the skateboard, I'm slowing down, I'm also noticing who's behind me so that they don't, you know, rear end me, and so on and so forth. Driving is actually a very complex task. So if you're having problems with visual spatial, with judgment, with remembering, you know, maybe the rules of the road, et cetera, et cetera, absolutely can be affected by cognition. Um, there, there's a, a book, um, uh, calls uh, uh, aging successful aging. Um, I'm blanking. Uh, I think it's actually uh, Dr. Dan Levitan, if I'm not mistaken. Um, I'll try to find it later on, but I'm pretty sure it's called successful aging, and it and it's actually very interesting. It goes through a lot of the science. You know, does this diet? 
prolong the survival versus that, or you know, you know, all these kinds of things, genetics, etc. And in his introduction, he says probably the two most important things to uh, successfully aging. One is genetics. Well, not a lot you can do about that, right? But two is being flexible, is have the ability to change, to having the insight into knowing, hey, things aren't working so well that way. Let me plan, let me adapt to do it another way, okay? So that I can still meet my goals of my quality of life, okay? Very difficult when it comes to driving. Uh, very commonly people get defensive and for good reason. You take a car away, especially if you live in a rural area, especially if you live in a, a big suburb where all the stores are like big box stores uh, far distances apart, not being able to drive will seriously impact your independence. There's no question. There are alternatives. And whenever we start discussing driving, we got to discuss what are uh, alternatives. But we have to ask. Um, it is our professional and ethical obligation to ask a person about their driving if we are diagnosing them with cognitive problems, particularly if we are diagnosing them with a, a more and more and more advanced dementia or certain kinds of dementia. Uh, we are ethically and, and professionally obliged to tell the driving bureau, the SIQ, about this person's medical information. We're not deciding whether the person keeps their license or not. And, and the SIQ may perfectly say, uh, no, this person's fine. Maybe just make these little adaptations and we'll reassess you next year and don't worry about it. But I have to report. And to be honest, in some provinces and some jurisdictions, doctors are legally required to inform the driving bureaus, uh, Ontario, for example. And if they don't, there could, they could be subject to, uh, to um, civil lawsuits and so forth, okay? So we may be asking things to the family or, or to the person with uh, cognitive impairment, you know, are you comfortable being a passenger in this person's car? Or even better, would you let your dad drive your children to school? Uh, would you let your husband drive the grandkids to the park? Okay. And if the person says, oh, God, no, no, no way. Okay. Hey, there's a problem. There's a little red flag there. Why are you saying that? Okay. Accidents, near misses, traffic violations, um, subtle things like self-restricting their driving. I, you know, I used to drive on all the highways, but you know what? Um, I don't drive on highways anymore. Well, why aren't you driving on highways anymore? You know, your spidey senses are tingling there telling you something, right? Have you gotten lost? Uh, did you need a co-pilot? And so on and so forth. And to be frank, when we renew our driver's permits, we are supposed to answer if you have cognitive problems or if you have any change in your functional independence. Legally, we're supposed to declare that, okay? Um, and for more information on this, the SIQ website actually has, uh, has good information on there, okay? We also need to plan for progression. Again, going back to supports, but also knowing the system, what is out there. If you need help in X, what is out there to help you with that? What is not out there? You know, what can you not expect to happen? So some people will say, well, I'm fine at home until X, Y, Z happens, and then I should move to a residence. Then I agree to move to a residence. Well, moving to a residence doesn't happen like this, okay? You need to plan for these kinds of things. Same for thing for family, okay? Um, financial issues I mentioned earlier, um, particularly for family members, um, and the, then the goals of care, the big picture. What matters most to me? And this may include things like, do I want uh, um, artificial life support, you know, intensive care, breathing machines, uh, dialysis, artificial uh, kidneys, that kind of thing, uh, artificial feeding through, through uh, tube feedings, and so on and so forth. Some people have never really thought about it, and so it's worth giving some thought to. Some people have lived the experience and thought, you know, I saw my father go through that. I never want to go through that myself. Okay, put it down on paper. Let people know. It, it can change. You can always change your mind, okay? But if you're very clear of what you do and do not want, uh, you know, document it so people know or at least tell people so that they know. Living arrangements can be a very, very delicate one, as I alluded to earlier, okay? 
um, know what the options are. That, you know, I'm not ready to move to a residence yet. Okay. But people have started talking about it. You started thinking about it. You know what? Start looking around. Oh, yeah, I want to live in this neighborhood. Well, start looking. What's available in that neighborhood? How do I get in there? How much does it cost? What kind of facilities do they have? And you don't have to go there now, but at least you know. So when you know you do need to go, or if you do need to go, you've done all the legwork already. Your family's your family. Uh, you've done the legwork already. Competency assessment, so and so, is is also a very contentious issue that may come up in planning. Um, so the more that is planned in advance, the less uh, contentious it can be later on in life. Um, typically regarding finances and where a person lives because of safety. And then end of life uh, care planning, as I mentioned earlier uh, as well, okay? You wanna maintain your general health in terms of maintaining your other health conditions, keeping as physically active as possible, which is good for numerous health conditions. I'll come back to that in a sec. You wanna minimize or frankly even stop substance use um, you know, you hear about, oh, a glass of red wine is good for your memory. Okay, that may be for prevention. But now if you're actually having memory problems now, um, or you're having falls or whatever, it's probably not good anymore. So if you don't miss it, get rid of it. Or if you're drinking three, have two. And if you're having two, have one or, you know, etc. Okay, the less things that put strain on your brain, the so much the better. Depression. Uh, definitely can happen in dementia amongst many other health conditions. Um, watch for it, treat it if it does happen. Don't just brush it under the rug, sweep it under the rug. And all of these things exactly go for the caregiver as well, okay? Because if the caregiver is the captain of the ship and the captain goes down, the whole ship goes down, right? So caregiver, you need to also make sure your health is stable, you are keeping physically active and doing the activities you enjoy. You like playing bridge once a week, fine. Get somebody, get so-called respite care for somebody to stay with your family member so that you can get to bridge club, okay? That's important. Otherwise you will burn out and you will go down too, okay? Cognition specific treatments, um, to be honest, there's not a lot out there. There are no cures, okay? But we try to contain things. Uh, without medications, to be honest, most of it are so-called lifestyle changes, okay? And these mostly have a role in prevention. They may have a role in mild cognitive impairment before it starts taking an impact on function to slow or uh, possibly prevent progression to major neurocognitive disorder to dementia, okay? That's, there's more and more data coming out on this. Um, but it's obviously good for other health conditions. It's good for your blood pressure, your cholesterol, your diabetes, et cetera, et cetera. So, you know, just do it kind of thing, right? Um, but things like substance, uh, alcohol reduction in particular, things like hearing correction, okay? There's an in interesting association with hearing impairment and subsequent development of dementia. Okay, um, and it, we used to think, oh, it's just because the person didn't hear us. It's as if they look like they're demented, but no, it seems to be more than that. Maybe it's because they're not having the same, you know, sensory input into the brain when you are able to hear in social activities and whatever. Um, so you know what? That's uh, many people say, oh, my hearing's fine. You know, the family are pulling their hair out. The life hearing's fine, whatever. This might be another reason to get hearing correction. Forget your family. You know, forget, you know, whatever else. If you want to preserve your brain as much as possible, this may be a way to do it. And it makes a lot of sense. If you keep whacking your brain all the time and injuring your brain, you know, brain injury itself, like football players, uh, you know, they keep getting the concussions to the head and then they develop this kind of uh, early onset uh, dementia. You want to avoid whacking your head. So if you're having a lot of falls, what can we do to prevent falls so that you don't sustain head traumas? Um, when it comes to natural supplements, to be quite honest, many, many are mentioned, many have been looked at, many are being looked at, but so far none, none, none are coming out to say clearly that this is a benefit. Most of them are of no harm, with some exceptions, but generally have not shown any benefit. And, and to see, you know, what is really the research on the benefits, what are the potential harms, I encourage you to check out uh, this, um, this is from the National Institutes of Health in the States, Medline Plus, and they have a section called Drugs and uh, 
herbs and supplements or something like that. And they list all these different natural products. You can click on it, you know, uh, ginkgo biloba, click on ginkgo biloba. What is the evidence for and against memory uh, loss? Uh, you know, are there dangerous interactions? Uh, where can I go for more information? I, I use this myself and I use it with patients and families, okay? But so far not, but if, you know, you like the taste of coconut, then by all means, there is interesting stuff going on with, with parts of coconut oil. The problem is, is that we don't know exactly what parts and how much and, 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 and how pure the sources are. In terms of prescription medications, it's mainly to try to maintain the existing neurons communicating with each other as long as possible while they're still there. But eventually at a certain point, there will be less and less of those brain cells, those neurons to sustain and the medication effects will wear off, okay? So it might stabilize or maybe even improve things for a period of time, but gradually one, two years later, things will start to decline again, okay? And unfortunately, we can't tell exactly who will respond and who will not. That's why we sometimes say, well, let's try it. As long as it's not causing side effects, um, let's give it a go, okay? So in Canada, there's pretty much four medications approved for this. There are the so-called acidic cholinesterase inhibitors, the most common one being Dinepazil, the brand name is Aricept, you may have heard of, also the Rivastigmine patch. It is available in pill form as well, but the pill form tends to cause more uh, stomach side effects and so forth. So we'll usually uh, use a patch if we use that. And then there's another one, a completely different mechanism of function, but um, called memantine, which may have some benefits in more advanced dementia, um, or not. There may or may not be some benefit of using both of them. So if one has started to wear off its effect, adding the other might have some added benefit. Again, the science is still a little bit back and forth on that. Um, and these, uh, unless you have private drug insurance, these require uh, government approval for the government to pay for them. So typically the doctor has to make the request in the beginning, six months later, 12 months later, and then every year. And the purpose being is that the government wants the doctor to reassess, is it still making a difference? Because it's, if it's not, they don't wanna keep paying for it, right? So that response means either there is some improvement in objective testing, like those memory tests in their function, in their social interactions, in their behavior, in the mood, okay? If that improves or stabilizes, that's considered a positive response that the medication quote unquote worked, okay? Because the alternative is that it continues to decline. But there are side effects with every kinds of thing, okay? So we got to consider the side effects and is it really worth it if the benefits are modest, okay? That's why we want to say, you know, planning and adaptation is the main treatment. There are certain situations where it actually may help for other reasons than just memory but uh, those would be discussed with you at the time. Many people have heard about the new Alzheimer medication. Uh, last summer, it was a big deal. Um, So-called immunotherapy to try to target uh, of not building up the abnormal proteins in the brain that, that caused the cells to degenerate. Um, but uh, it's still only approved in the States. It's not convenient to give. It can have a lot of side effects. And the controversies have to do with things like it's very high cost, um, uncertain if it actually has clinically significant benefits. Sure, maybe the MOCA point went up uh, by two uh, went, went up by two points, but what does that really mean in real life? Um, it requires specialized testing that generally you cannot access, and so on and so forth. Okay, so there's stuff in the pipeline and it's targeting all kinds. It's trying to target things even before there's cognitive problems, as well as uh, when things are starting to early onset and as things become more obvious, whether it's in the bloodstream, whether it's in the uh, 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 spinal fluid that bathes the brain, whether it's on imaging tests or whether it's on functional assessment. Um, there are things in the pipeline, but still what I mentioned earlier is the mainstay of things. Okay, and lastly, because I think this is a question that came up a priori, um, how do we manage the behaviors, okay? The number one treatment of the behavioral and psychological symptoms of dementia is to counter those behaviors with other behaviors, 
okay? So-called behavior management. So keep things as routine as possible because when routines change, that's often when a person gets, you know, they can't figure out what's going on. And so they react somehow like becoming more anxious or becoming more agitated, more angry. Classic example is they live with one child for most of the year and then for two months a year they go to the other child's home in another province and in the beginning things just completely fall apart because the routine has changed but once they get back into a routine there things will probably settle down okay same thing with moving to a residence things may be rocky in the beginning but once a person gets back into a new routine things generally tend to settle down okay Along those lines, identify triggers. You know, if it's always telling the person, I told you that already, don't you remember I told you that? And that just escalates things. Don't do it, <laughs> you know? Find other ways like distracting them, you know, saying yes, uh, uh, that was, uh, you know, a difficult situation or, you know, whatever, you know, hey, well, by the way, you know, we needed to do this, that, the other thing. Uh, deflect things, uh, acknowledge, but you don't necessarily have to agree with a false belief and then move on. Um, music, hobbies, whatever else to, 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 to take their mind off whatever is, is causing them and you distress, okay? Um, just another example, a, a, a daughter was telling me that the mother was very agitated at night. And what that agitation meant is that she was getting up pacing around uh, her, her bedroom, folding, unfolding, moving things, et cetera, et cetera, particularly folding things, folding the blankets, unfolding the blankets, whatever. I said, you know what? If that's something she's doing and is used to doing and seems to occupy her, then leave out the laundry. Let her fold the laundry. You know, two birds, one stone. The laundry gets fo folded, felt, <laughs> and, and she feels that she has something to do, okay? And, and, and that's kind of... It helped with that, okay? So there's, this is through the Alzheimer's Society, but obviously other resources, including AGI, uh, but a little booklet on understanding, and it gives very concrete, you know, this is what's happening, try this, but avoid doing that. You know, like avoid escalating, avoid confronting kind of thing. Um, the McGill uh, School of Occupational Therapy also developed uh, a booklet with different kinds of activities that you can either do with the person or have the person do by themselves um, and, and adjusted to how bad the dementia is or not. Um, and so it gives sort of concrete examples, which is nice as well, because, you know, it's nice for me to say uh, deflect and distract, but what does that actually mean? Well, here they actually give you some concrete examples. Um, Medications for BPSD, though, I'll tell you, are all off-label use and basically sedate the person. So there's many different kinds, antipsychotics, antidepressants, sedatives, but all of them can have side effects, including falls and more confusion. So we re really got to think of the risk benefits and we have to use it the lowest possible dose for the shortest period of time as, as possible, okay? And ideally, only if it's really causing the person or the family a lot of distress or safety uh, concerns. So I'll end off with that, um, just because there's only a few minutes left, I realize, sorry, again. <laughs> um, but uh, all the things that I mentioned are uh, in the handout, okay? Uh, as well as some other supplementary information to go through. Thank you, Dr. Chu. That was, we, we can just listen to you and, and want more and more and more all the time. So I really appreciate that. Um, a few, do you have time for a few questions? Yep, yep no problem. Okay, excellent. Um, someone asked about insight to the disease and does everyone um, who has a diagnosis of dementia have insight to the disease? Um, or okay. system capacity. Do they have it? So does everyone have insight when they receive that diagnosis of dementia? Definitely not. <laughs> and, and, and I'm sure many, many, many of you there have experienced this where my memory is fine. You know, what are you telling them I have memory problems or better? You know, what we often do is we're seeing the person and their family member at the same time, and the family member slightly behind them. We're talking to the person, asking them, but we're also glancing at the family member to see how the family member is reacting, because it's often very uncomfortable to speak in front of your 
parent, your spouse or whatever to say they're having this, that and the other problem, right? So I can get a sense sometimes that the caregiver has more things to say, but they're not comfortable saying it there uh, because the person doesn't have insight and will get defensive. Having said that, though, there are some people who amazingly do and accept and go with the flow. And that's that successful aging thing. The more, If you're able to do that, if your personality is such that you're able to do that, going with the flow, life is just so much easier for yourself and for everyone else. Yeah, I think we see at AGI, um, they might have been told they have a, the diagnosis, but they might forget about it. So yeah. Yeah. For families to constantly remind them of the diagnosis, um, it yeah. becomes painful yeah. um, for both um, people. Yeah. Yeah. Also, um, some people might not be able to verbalize exactly the insight, but you can see when they're, where they're struggling. Yeah. So yeah. we always yeah. suggest to support the person, validate them, be, be where they're yeah. at. Yeah. Um, and allow them to save face as well. You know, yeah. when we do the cognitive testing, and I, I'm pretty sure the person's not going to do so well, um, but I see that they're very defensive, very defensive, which is normal because, you know, you don't, you want to look, you don't want to look bad kind of thing. I will actually tell them, listen, this test, there's some very easy questions. Please don't be insulted. I have to ask them. And there's some questions that look hard, but there are uh, some questions that look very easy, but they're actually quite difficult. Okay. And, and, and so same thing for family members, the person's having, I, you know, I told you, you can't do that. No, you know what, there's no point in confronting like that, unless it's a safety issue, pick your battles. If it's a safety issue, yes, but otherwise. And I also find that it's hard for if you, if the family doesn't think that they have insight and they're still talking about the person in front of them as if they're not there. Yeah. Yeah. You know, that's really a, a struggle for the person with the, the cognitive impairment because they might be grasping some of the information. Yeah. So we, we try to treat everyone, you know, as if they are part of that conversation. That's so. it. Even, even and, and I try to, I mean, I, you know, nobody's perfect. I, I, I sometimes do that myself, but I really consciously try and I teach my trainees uh, to be conscious about addressing things to the person, yeah. even if what you're saying is really to the caregiver. Okay. Yeah. Um, but uh, yeah, definitely to do that. Otherwise, it's it feels humiliating. Otherwise, Absolutely. and if you're the family member, and the doctor is only talking to you all the time, trust me, I've had this too. What I will sometimes do with my family member, what I was doing, the person's talking to me all the time. I kept looking at my family member instead. I wasn't looking at the person talking to me. I kept looking there to kind of force them to look yeah. there as well. Yeah, <laughs> you know? and then maybe just being honest to the the physician yeah, or the like, professional and saying why can you, can you direct yeah, it yeah absolutely yeah, yeah. um there's another question about driving um mm -hmm. so is uh is there a driving course at the jewish general hospital to evaluate the person's ability to drive um and if not where can they go because obviously um you know the physician can make that have to make that that referral mm -hmm. um and we say that is because you were saying it's more than just memory. It's more than just someone saying turn right, turn left. Yeah. You, you talked about all the complexities of driving. So, so what's that kind of step and where can they get some families can get some support? Okay. So there's things that you can do when things have been uh, mentioned, reported to the SIQ. And then there are things that you can try to do preventatively. So preventatively, um, there are people who like to retake driver's learner's uh, ed kind of thing, just to brush up on their skills, make sure that there's no new rules of the road, like I'm still discovering rules of the road, but anyhow, um, you know, and, and if the instructor is saying, hey, you know, you need to practice this more, practice that more, then go ahead and do it. That's kind of a little proactive way. Um, but what more typically happens is that you get a notice from the SAC. There's a routine actually right now, although it may change. Um, at age 75, at age 80, and for every two years after that, whether you're a good driver or not, you will automatically get forms for your family doctor to fill and your eye, health, uh, eye care professional to fill, right? Many of you have received this already. Um, and it's just to say, hey, are there any issues going on with your health and your vision that could affect your driving? If not, wonderful, have a nice life. I'll see you again in two years. Um, uh, but if there is, then what happens is that you get a letter from the SAC advising you what to do next based on the information that they received from the eye care, from the, from the medical physician, okay? Um, and they may say something like, 
you're okay to drive, but we restrict you to these certain conditions, no night driving, no highway, something like that. And mm -hmm. we will retest you in a year. Or they may say you are have to stop driving now until you go get a formal driving assessment. So I have to admit, I'm not aware of a program specifically at the Jewish, but it, there may be, I, I'm just not aware of it. But there are um, in the public system and in the private system, driving specialized occupational therapists, because driving is one of the occupations, who do do this. Um, yeah. So if interested, I can provide resources on that. And obviously to access the public though, that has to go through through public healthcare professionals. Yeah, and what's interesting is these restrictions you were talking about. So there's times where someone would say, okay, well, you can drive, but you can only drive with a passenger. Yeah, a co-pilot. Exactly, which is really hard for families actually, because it's it's, if the families don't feel comfortable with the person driving at all, and then all of a sudden they have to, you know, be part of that, and because the person really enjoys driving or, or feels that need to, to be independent, it's a really hard position that sometimes they put families in. Tell the family, uh, the, tell the healthcare professional though, then who said okay. that. And if you're not comfortable saying it in front of the person, you can either asked to speak later or when the person's being physically examined speak to another healthcare professional or you can call back or you can send a note whatever way you can give as much information as you want to the healthcare professional the the, the doctor may not be allowed to tell you things without the person's consent but they can you can tell them whatever you want so if you tell them listen i understand you said that but i'm really 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 uncomfortable to do that doctor would probably think hey maybe there's some nuance that i'm missing here for that person to be so worried about it, maybe we do need to get a formal assessment. Yeah, okay, thank you. Um, just a few quick questions. Um, you talked about you know, getting the routine follow-up to make sure there's no depression or the depression can be treated. So um, I know I mentioned this in the past, but when people living with dementia get very emotional, um, there's a time where they can get very emotional where whether they're trying, they're, tears are expressed in either joyful events or sad events or just thinking of a memory of you know how much they love their family member mm -hmm. how, how is there any kind of um treatment that you would suggest to help with those emotions or is it simply just being present and validating um that person well i, I would say there's probably twofold i mean if it is genuinely what they are feeling at the time then yes it's like anybody uh, but they have a lower threshold to to demonstrate that emotion. You know, they're so happy I could cry. I mean, that's an expression, yes. right? And then they actually start Absolutely. crying, but they're happy. That's okay. So they're like, you know, kind of laugh through the happy tears kind of thing, or they're, they are sad and they are crying because they're sad. Then yeah, exactly as you said, you support it. Like anybody else who's feeling sad, whether or not they're crying. But what we we'll sometimes see, particular with vascular dementia, where it affects certain types, uh, parts of the brain, like the, 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 the brain stem and so forth. We can have what's called emotional lability, you know? So they're not actually sad, but they start crying or they're sad and they just start laughing, you know, inappropriately or out of place or whatever kind of thing. And it's beyond their control. Same thing with the frontal lobe uh, um, uh, dysfunction is that they may have uh, less ability to filter those emotions. So they may show them more extremely and, and, and whatnot. And in those kinds of situations where it just seems this is like really not appropriate or weird, you can ask them, how are you feeling right now? You know, and if it's not an appropriate reaction, then, you know, if it's not an issue, safety issue, whatever, you let it go. Um, but if it is causing problems, social disruption, uh, causing them distress, causing you distress, then it becomes those behavior management strategies of, you know, yeah, okay. And so then, you know, we were talking about that other, you know, whatever, whatever. There's more intelligent things in the resources I gave. And I think that we have to still remember that even though they have a diagnosis, that they're still a person and <laughs> that, you know, it's, it's one thing to always want to... Um, get that person out of that uncomfortable behavior, whether they're really agitated or angry or anxious, you know, offering them a cookie isn't really going to help them necessarily um, calm down or, yeah. you know, um, change of thought or, you know, they yeah. might really need to be able wanting to express themselves. So, um, you know, that's, uh, 
that's something that we always try yeah. to guide the families as well. And I mentioned that term responsive behaviors. Mm-hmm. Is this emotion in response to something else? Like they cannot yeah. articulate that they're in pain yeah. or cannot articulate that they're cold, something like that. Okay, and, maybe and, this is the reason. And very often looking at body language mm-hmm. can help or looking at the environment can definitely help. And sometimes you might need a friend or a neighbor or a family member to come in and say, okay, well, what do you see that I'm not seeing? Because mm-hmm. families might be so, you know, in absorbed. Into too the close. Screen. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah. Absolutely. Yeah. So, um, you know, Dr. Chu, I really appreciate this, the way that you give examples. It makes it very real. I'm sure everyone wants to uh, be your patient if they <laughs> have to live with this, because it seems like you actually really understand beyond the medical aspects and, and understand the perspective of the family and the person living with dementia and, and very often families feel like they, they don't have enough time in in those medical follow-ups and or they don't feel like they can share information so i appreciate your openness to to hear from families i do just want to say one thing that um you were talking a lot about support groups and, and making sure that you have to kind of make sure that you know what you're signing up for. It's true. Everything that, that you've talked about today, everything has to really have that person-centered approach. Um, they have to, It has to be the right fit for you to get that support. So some people might really suggest take a support group, but maybe they're not a group person. Mm-hmm. Maybe, um, you know, they prefer individual counseling or whatnot. So, so please, whoever's listening, um, make sure that it's the right um, care plan um, or, or strategies that you need yourself. Yeah. So thank you yeah. for that. Okay. Um, if ever you need support, please don't hesitate to call AGI. We're here to help or guide you um, to the right resources. And Dr. Chu, um, thank you again so much for your time. I know you're very busy. Oh, my pleasure. Thank okay. you. Okay, and I'll make sure that your the that the document that you sent me okay. um, will be sent out to anyone who registered for today. Perfect. Thanks okay. so much. Thank you. Have a great day. Bye-bye.